team representative 15 and members of the committee. Great to see you Monday morning. Uh, this testimony is against both bills since you decided to do them together. They were quite similar and uh, I'll just take care of the one and you'll have the written. So. Thank you. The premise of this bill assumes that the reason people choose not to vaccinate is because of a lack of information. The truth is just the opposite. There's a vast body of information about the effects of vaccines on the health of individuals who, choose, who do choose to get vaccinated because of the misinformation put out by the industry and perpetuated by the medical community the public is inundated with stories that don't use the facts that are in evidence any parent making a choice for their child shoulders a heavy burden against the tide of misinformation regarding the dangers of vaccination this group is acutely aware that they are making choices that carry far beyond themselves and therefore make sure they are well informed and not of that is the group of people who are making choices about themselves and their children. The new National Adult Immunization Plan aggressively targets pregnant women, employers, and their employees, faith-based groups, and other adults for increased vaccine use. Healthcare workers are already being fired if they do not get an annual flu shot, a vaccine that works less than half the time, and was completely ineffective this year. The next profession on the firing line is the teaching profession. A doctor-turned-politician in Vermont is pushing a bill to require teachers and everyone working in a school to prove that they have received government-recommended vaccines or be revaccinated. When the ingredients of vaccines became public information, many people began to question the benefits versus the risk. It turned out that the manufacturers were using known poisons in vaccines and that a previously unknown disease, now well known as autism, began to appear in children who were vaccinated. The manufacturers of the vaccines have resisted efforts to make changes even though children following the recommended vaccination schedule are given 49 doses of 14 <coughs> federally recommended vaccines by age 6 and 20 more vaccinations by age 18. This gives children a dose of mercury 87 times higher than the accepted safe level. This and other information about the cycles of disease opened up the personal exemption that allowed <coughs> parents who were concerned about their children to opt out of vaccinations. And Mississippi came up already. So Mississippi, the most vaccinated state in the union, 99.9%, has the highest rate of infant mortality and is also ranked the least healthiest state, including a high rate of infectious disease. When people follow the law and make choices that are theirs to make, there can be no, adjust, no justification to allow fear to condone discrimination. While the theory of herd immunity has not been proven, herd mentality has. It has allowed the industry to push for more restrictions on who can make choices about their health, regardless of the concerns they have. We have accepted that a person can make choices unless those choices become dangerous. No danger has been proven. We must not make laws based on herd mentality. We have many folks here with personal stories, as well as evidence to support my claims and refute those of an industry that has a strong financial stake in the status quo. You will see that the debate about vaccines has been one-sided because of the $30 billion and growing industry the vaccines represent to the pharmaceutical industry. With this much money at stake, it will be hard to get honest information <coughs> from a group that sees the right to choose as a cut to their bottom line. I urge you to vote ought not to pass to protect the personal freedoms this country stands for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're right, right on time. Good job. Uh, any questions for Senator Miramont? Oh, Representative Sanderson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator, for being here. Would you please be able to provide us with the information regarding this particular passage you stated? I will do that. Thank you. Representative Bashan? I can look that up. What happens on this is that the allopathic medical world, the one who used to be on with MDs, and 
that world sees it one way and will and believes it. Absolutely. And yet there are many of the members who have stepped outside of it and gone into alternative forms of helping people because they see some things don't work. They see it another way and believe it. You'll hear that all day long today. So that you will get an absolute link will be hard, but you'll hear from members who that link is very absolutely believed to be true and have made choices for their subsequent children. And um, So I, I don't know that we'll find absolute. Maybe somebody here today will tell you because we've got some really not knowledgeable people about it. But I'll find out what I can. Can I just make a comment? Sure, please continue. Um, I think generally with, with um, infant death, the states are tracking what what was the cause of, of infant if infant death. So I'm just I, I'd be interesting interested yeah. in seeing the report specifically around that. Thank you. Sure, that's such a good thing. Yeah. Representative Malvin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Is there any um, statistical information regarding the correlation between this infant mortality and their scores on the FGAR scale? No idea. Again, see what I can get. Any additional questions? Seeing no additional questions. Thank you very much, Senator, for being here. Thank you very much. It's good to see you in this committee. I'll be happy to hear yes. more. <laughs> All right. Uh, are there any other legislative co-sponsors or or anti-co-sponsors <laughs> wish to wish to speak to these bills? Seeing none, then we'll move on to uh, proponents of the bill. And so here's, like I said, the way we're going to be proceeding is 10 for, 10 against, 10 neither for nor against. So I'm going to read off, based on the list I have in front of me, the first 10 people we'll hear from uh, as proponents and the first 10 people we'll hear from as opponents. Um, so, first we'll hear from, just three off the list so you can be ready for it, especially for folks who are in the Welcome Center. Uh, first we'll be hearing from Lisa Ryan of Maine Medical so uh, Association, uh, Chick, Chick, uh, Chick, Chick, Chiati, I'm sorry, Chikati, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name, so you'll be second, you'll be second, you'll be second, I'm second. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, uh, just reading off the list. All right, well, uh, one more moment, we'll get to that. Uh, then Jerry Greenwall, Shannon Gervais, uh, Jenna Met, 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 What happened to the lights? Uh, Laura Labdell, South Portland. And I, again, I apologize for all these names. I'm going to be embarrassing myself this whole time. Um, Avenel Dane of Bath, Donald Burgess of Kennebuck, Doug Michael of Bar Harbor, Lynn Connolly of Biddeford. Then for opponents, once we get through those 10 people, we'll hear from um, Holly Bluss from the governor's office, Ginger Taylor of Brunswick, Mary Pollard, Pollard. Oh, whatever was just said there. Uh, Mark Blacksell, Meryl Nash, <coughs> Jessica Basalt, Robert, uh, Robert Kennedy, um, Terry, I can't read the, uh, how this kind of Venice, all right, Stephanie Erickson, this is all photocopied, so it's not necessarily just your handwriting, um, Carol, Carol <coughs> Cumberland, Ellen Stan Stanley of Ellsworth, so uh, those will be, um, we do have one more legislator here, um, I guess to speak again, since we did allow one, we should allow another. Um, but you are going to have a four minute time. Welcome, Representative. Good morning, <coughs> Senator Brakey, Representative Kassim. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Pretty good. Close? Okay. Um, I'm Representative David Sawicki, uh, representing District 64, which consists of the town of Minot and part of Auburn. Um, I have a, a bill on this topic called LD950, which would assert our individual rights um, to not have any discrimination uh, regarding <coughs> which vaccines we choose to have or not have uh, taken. Uh, and I'm here to talk about uh, vaccines as a product and to hope that the committee will 
understand that a vaccine, even though it comes in a bottle and it's administered by a doctor, it's a for-profit product. And uh, unlike any other product in this country or even in the world, uh, the, the vaccine manufacturers have been given blanket immunity by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court's reasoning was that vaccines are inherently dangerous and they're, they're are, they are uh, likely to cause unintended con consequences or actually cause a disease that they're intended to uh, vaccinate somebody against. I have several documents. I don't have copies yet, but I will distribute these uh, to the committee later today. And um, when you think about freedom of choice and compelling anybody in this country to put a product into their body when they believe that there's a risk that it could cause harm or that they may not need it, um, I think uh, for the folks that are here voting on this issue, um, I think it's incumbent on you to do a deep dive into the research. And I know there are going to be a lot of people testifying here today verbally, but the research and the evidence is extensive that vaccines do cause unintended consequences. You're going to hear testimony from parents whose kids changed after they were given a vaccine that was, quote, required by the school. And we are here to speak out against compulsory vaccination. I don't think we are anti-vaccine. I believe we look at vaccines as a product. Some of us like to uh, drink Pepsi. Some of us like to drink Diet Coke. We have that choice. Uh, a vaccine um, is a product that's intended to protect people from uh, contracting a disease. Um, and, and that's a noble, noble cause. Um, but the, the noble cause shouldn't trample the rights of the individuals who decide that it may not be the right product for them. And that's the extent of my testimony. And uh, again, I just would hope that you would do a deep dive into all the documentation that's going to be provided to you because the decision you're making about removing a philosophical exemption, um, there are many different levels that argument could be made. We don't have enough time to go into all the arguments, but I really wish that you would do your research and, and come to realize that these products aren't 100% benign, and there are serious side effects that many people here are suffering for the rest of their lives. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Representative. Uh, as a, two questions. Representative Vashon, followed by Representative Anderson. Good morning. Good morning. If not vaccines, what do you think is the best tool to protect whole populations against devastating diseases such as polio, tuberculosis, measles, whooping cough? And what do you think, without vaccines and without the fear of discrimination, is the best way to ensure that whole populations do not get infected with a deadly disease? <coughs> Thank you for your question, and um, I guess you could make the argument that practically any disease is potentially deadly. People die from pneumonia, people die from flu, um, and you know measles. I guess, I guess people can die from measles. Um, health, nutrition, building up our immune system naturally will give us the resistance we need. If you look at the incidence of, of measles in this country, there's a, there's a famous graph. It shows it falling precipitously uh, at the beginning, at the turn of the century, without any vaccines. And the graph, the incidence of measles goes like this. And then the vaccines are introduced at this point of the curve, and the benefit of the vaccine is negligible, just looking at the graph. So there are other factors that affect, or that, that contribute to the health of a population. In the case of the turn of the century, we have better, better sanitation, we have indoor plumbing, we have better health care in general. And again, if you look at the evidence, you'll see that 99% of the gains in protecting people from deadly disease is not attributed to the vaccine in the case of the measles. In the case of polio, I have a, an extensive ar uh, article here that's a compendium of research. There are maybe 100 footnotes. Um, and I'll just read one quote from the, uh, the person who invented the, uh, the vaccine, Dr. Jonas Salk, 1976. He testified that the live virus vaccine, parentheses, used almost exclusively in the U.S. from the early 60s to 2000s, was the, quote, principal if not sole cause of all reported polio cases in the U.S. since 1961. There's evidence, research, and uh, studies that, that, that support that. This is, 
This is in the scientific literature. This is a very detailed case study talking about the efficacy or efficacy or lack thereof of the polio vaccine. There are also plenty of unintended consequences and damages that were caused by, by that particular vaccine. So it's important to understand that vaccines are not perfect products. They may, it may be a, a perfect ideal to protect everyone against every disease in the world, um, but we should have the choice as free human beings to decide to either perhaps we isolate ourselves, we, we homeschool, or we, we, we take certain nutrients or take care of ourselves in a certain way to strengthen our own immune system. We're born with a system to protect ourselves from the diseases that exist in our environment. Uh, Representative Kaminsky. All right. <laughs> Seeing no further questions, uh, Representative Hammond. Thank you. Great for your testimony. Um, as you probably know, Maine has one of the highest uh, rates of violence in uh, the country. Conversely, um, we have uh, one of the lowest rates of uh, immunization. Um, it seems to me that that would uh, contradict uh, what you're saying that uh, autism is caused by. <laughs> that, that's one data point. And thank you for your question. Um, there's, there's. <laughs> If you look at, and I'm not saying that, I'm not, I, I'm not a scientist here to, to talk about the causation of, of autism, but if you look at the explosive growth in these um, uh, immuno-triggered, uh, uh, actually that's not an immuno-triggered issue, that's, that's an issue caused by mercury in, in, in the vaccine. <laughs> Um, but if you look at the, the rate of growth in autism, which went from 1 in 10,000, I believe, to now it's 1 in 68. That all began uh, around 1989, the growth, the accelerated growth of autism, type 1 diabetes, um, and other issues that are directly correlated to the volume of vaccines given to our kids starting around 1989. So do we know that there is, do we have proof I think other people will be talking today about scientific proof connecting autism and thimerosal in the vaccines. Um, there's enough reasonable doubt with the science that we know today to give us all pause to say, you know what, I see some risks with this product, therefore I'm going to take that risk because there could be a wonderful benefit to me and my children and I'm willing to take that risk for them. Or we may say, well for that particular vaccine, you know, maybe the HIV vaccine, um, I don't want to take that vaccine. I don't want my kids to take that vaccine because they doubt they're, they're going to be exposed to that. What you're all talking about today wipes that off the board. Okay, so you're not necessarily saying that uh, there is, in fact, a causation or correlation. But until There's a correlation. There's a very tight correlation between the volume of vaccine medicine given to our kids starting around 1989 and the, the explosive growth in autism. Sure. Until, but until we can determine causation. Uh, you're saying that it's reasonable to not require parents to do that. You said it better than you thought. Right? <laughs> I will say, I'm not going to cut off questions, but we do have a, but you, so you're welcome to ask. We just, we do have a lot of people from the public we need to hear from today. So Representative Bursting. Thank you. Good morning, Representative. Good morning. Um, would you please provide us with your studies that you, with, especially the polio statement that you made, <laughs> and also will you give us um, a written testimony, please? I'd be like to do it. Can I get that to you in the next day or so? Thank you. Right. Seeing no additional questions. Thank you, Donna. Thank you very much. Oh, Representative Heinrichson. Thanks. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Have you ever seen a case of diphtheria or polio or meningococcal meningitis? Um, polio is <laughs> a neighbor, uh, an elderly lady who contracted polio after being vaccinated. <clears throat> Have you ever seen an intercompany in the Personally, no. Diphtheria? No. no. Do you know how deadly they are? I do not. They are. Diseases are deadly, I agree. They are. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Jim. All right. <clears throat> now moving on, as, as, as promised to uh, two proponents, First, we'll hear from Lisa Ryan of Maine Medical Association. Thank you. Good morning, Senator Riki. 
Good morning, Representative Bettine and esteemed members of the committee. My name is Lisa Ryan, and I am a resident of Naples. I am a physician, and I practice pediatrics full-time <coughs> at Bridgeton Hospital, and I am currently the president for the Maine Medical Association. Uh, one thing I just wanted to mention, um, because we've been hearing a lot about thimerosal and mercury, and the Maine Immunization Program, um, all childhood vaccinations that I give to children in my office under age five do not contain thimerosal and do not contain mercury. Um, so I just wanted to, to let you all know that right now, those immunizations do not have thimerosal in them that we are administering in our offices. Um, it is my personal opinion and belief that immunizations, by far, are one of the most important public health advances in medicine to date. We have the ability, the ability not only to protect Maine's children and young adults from potentially deadly and devastating illnesses, but also to prevent epidemics of these diseases by ensuring that all children in Maine receive these vaccinations at the appropriate times. There is irrefutable evidence that vaccination saves lives. National and international professional healthcare organizations, including the World Health Organization, the Centers for Disease Control, the American Academy of Pediatrics, promote immunizations as effective and an easy way to keep our children, families, and communities safe and healthy. In recent years, we have steadily seen Maine's immunization rates of children decline as more parents are choosing to opt out of immunizations for medical, religious, or philosophical reasons. And as of 2013, Maine is the seventh lowest state in the country for children aged 19 to 35 months to be up to date on their full recommended series of immunizations. I am here in support of LD 471, and my opinion is the intent of this piece of legislation is to promote informed decision-making among parents by ensuring that they receive scientific, credible, <coughs> medically-based information about immunizations and vaccine-preventable diseases when making this incredibly important decision for their children. The most appropriate place <coughs> for parents to receive this information is from their medical home and from their health care provider whom they trust to take care of their children and families. We must do all we can as citizens of Maine to ensure that the health and well-being of all Maine citizens are at the forefront of our public health efforts. I, I want to let you know also on a personal note, I see families that choose not to vaccinate. I, choose, I see families that choose to have alternative schedules. And we talk, we have discussions. I see families that choose to do all of the recommended immunizations and we have discussions and we have communication. And I think the most important thing to remember is that, as, been, as has been mentioned, parents want to do what's best for their children and for their families. And I want to be able to provide them with information and respect and support their decisions. And I think the intent of this piece of legislation is to really encourage and foster those relationships so that parents are making these decisions with the best base of knowledge available to them. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning on this very important public health issue. <clears throat> and I ask you to support policies that improve access, funding, and education for life-saving immunizations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Hymanson and Representative Bashwan. Thank you, welcome. Thank you. Could you pick one of the diseases that we're trying to prevent and describe it a little bit and describe how it's, it's um, passed along? Well, measles is, is a good example, as we, as we know from the outbreak recently in California. Measles is highly contagious. It's a respiratory infection. And as has been mentioned, we, we understand that vaccines are not 100% effective. So people have mentioned this herd immunity. And there's data that shows that when a certain percentage of a population is immunized, there's greater protection for the community that you are in. As we're decreasing our immunization rates, not only in Maine, but across the country, we're sort of losing some of that herd immunity so that someone who may come from another country, we certainly know that people travel internationally a lot these days. So someone was at Disneyland, perfect, you know, perfect environment for something to be incredibly epidemically spread um, with coughing and sneezing and, and, and we see over 200 cases. 
Um, several weeks ago, I got notification from the main CDC that there was uh, a person who was positive for measles in the Kittery outlets recently. So we're on high alert now to really be watching. Personally, I've, I've seen one case of measles when I was in my training, and it was from someone who was not from this country, and it was in the New York City area. Um, meningococcal meningitis that you mentioned is a deadly, is a deadly disease. Um, it's you present with fever and flu-like illness and you're achy and you're a young adult, a healthy young adult in your 20s and you go to the emergency room and you're diagnosed with the flu and you come back hours later um, potentially even dead from meningococcal meningitis. It's a, it's a terribly devastating disease. Yes, please continue. Mm -hmm. You go back to measles because um, you know people have measles parties in order to get their kids sick so that they 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 um, they can incur the the antibiotics themselves without a vaccine. Um, I'm a neurologist and I understand um, um, measles encephalitis. Can you talk about measles encephalitis a little bit? That's I think one in a thousand cases of people who get measles. I, the, the one person that I saw had, had measles pneumonitis, so they were affected from a pulmonary perspective. Um, I have never seen a case of encephalitis um, from measles. I have seen a case of encephalitis from varicella um, in a young adult uh, teenager who was hospitalized in her pediatric ICU in Vermont where I did my pediatric training. And it's potentially a devastating illness. If you survive, you can be left with um, intellectual disabilities, you can be left with motor disabilities, um, and <clears throat> the treatment is really, especially for measles, supportive treatment. There's not really an antibiotic or anything that you can give to cure measles, so it's really supportive therapy. Thank you for that story. I, I had a father who turned to me after his daughter survived the meningococcal meningitis, <coughs> and I said, I think she was fortunate she didn't die, and he said, if she had died, I would have sued you. And my, my take-home message from that is that people then understand that there aren't treatments for these disorders except supportive ones and people can die from them. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Representative Bashan. You mentioned in your testimony that you have parents that come in to talk about alternate schedules of, of immunizations. And I was curious <coughs> to understand why an alternate schedule, and I'm assuming that they're just choosing to have their children immunized um, later. And so my question was, why an alternate schedule? Um, would that be an option that you would promote for more parents if you thought that you could get more, more people immunized on that? That's a great question. I. There are some people that will not, there are some providers and some pediatricians that will not see families that choose not to immunize. Um, that isn't my belief personally. Um, I think that parents look at alternative schedules. You heard the mention of the number of immunizations that are given to children in the first two years of life, really, the first five years for your school required immunizations. I was in the age that I got a smallpox vaccine. The amount of immune boosting smallpox antigens that I got from one vaccine significantly overshadows all of the immune that we're giving with all of the vaccines with the dozens of vaccines that children get. So I think that um, people are nervous. Parents are nervous about doing three or four immunizations at one time. They like to space them out. I have conversations and I, I talk to parents about the diseases that I'm more concerned about, like pertussis. Uh, Hemophilus influenza, especially for children that are in daycare settings and are around a lot of other children. So we have conversations, and, and I respect their opinions and their thoughts. And I think, you know, for the most part, the majority of my patients get some immunizations. Maybe not all of them, but they get ones that, that we agree on are really important to get. Representative Sanderson. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. <clears throat> How long have you been a doctor here in Maine? I've been in Maine for 17 years. 17 years, okay. And, you, and in your testimony, you said you've seen one case of measles in New York? That was, that was not when I was in Maine, yes. That was when I was in my, in my training. Okay, so you haven't seen measles in Maine yet? No. All right. 
Um, I was just trying to pull up the CD. My laptop's not working here, but um, as a side note, maybe we can get the, the CDC data on, on measles for Maine for the work session. But um, I guess my question to you is, is in 17 years, the rate of autism diagnosis in the state of Maine has curved um, in, in our children being born has, has risen quite a bit, yet we're, 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 we're not, I guess how I want to ask this is, we are one of the lowest, have the fifth lowest immunization rate, correct? We're still not seeing measles here in Maine, except for maybe this one case right now. The latest outbreak was affecting out in California and stuff, was affecting individuals who were vaccinated for measles, not necessarily children who weren't vaccinated for measles. And our rate of autism is rising with the extra um, um, inoculations and vaccinations that we're giving our children. How, how do I put that all together in my mind that's not a clinical mind, I'm not a clinician, and not connect some of the dots in, in, in thinking that perhaps um, continuing to force vaccinations, or not necessarily force, but remove some of these choices for parents is a bad idea. Well, I think that um, we don't know what causes autism. You know, in the medical community, we, we, we do not know. There has been extensive research and data into immunizations, into mercury, into thimerosal, and, and there isn't data that supports that immunizations cause autism. We just don't have the scientific data to support that. Mm -hmm. And it's really difficult when we have something like SIDS, for example, also, that we just don't know what causes it, mm -hmm. and it's a devastating disorder for children. Mm -hmm. Yes, the incidence has gone up. I think we are much better at recognizing things along the autistic spectrum, that may be part of it, and we don't know what causes causes it. I feel confident to say that I strongly believe that immunizations do not cause autism. I can't explain why the incidence has gone up, and I can tell you from you know scientific perspective, we're continuing to look, to, to delve into understanding the mind and how this disorder develops. Okay, then help me, just one more follow-up, if you will, then. Um, just help me then understand why um, increasing the rate of vaccination in Maine will further protect our children, for, say, for, for measles, when we really haven't had many cases in the state for many years. Well, they hadn't had many cases in California either. I mean, I think the issue is, is that people travel. You know, this person in Kittery apparently was a visitor, was just traveling. Um, we see pertussis. You know, I see cases of pertussis, you know, every... Um, winter uh, and I think the thought is is that the immunizations are going to not protect you 100% but give you better protection should that disease show its face you know in a community that you live in or a school that your child attends thank you representative good team thank you thank you dr. Ryan so um <coughs> maybe along the lines of the question that Representative Sanderson was asking maybe this question is wrong maybe not so. Um, so it seems that What's driving one of the drivers behind the bill, maybe Superintendent Tucker's talk is also, is this issue around herd immunity. And as our vaccination rates decline, there's a concern um, you know, that, that there's, a, there's a tipping point. Mm -hmm. uh, at the, if you get to answer this question now or bring it back for the work session, what, what do we know about where that tipping point is? Is it, is it something that we, that there's is there evidence around it? Is, is it different um, vaccine by vaccine, disease by disease? I mean, if that's really what's driving what we're trying to do here, it would be helpful to know a little bit more about where we think we're going to and, and, I, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I think there is some, I don't have it right in front of me, but I can, I can look at get, getting that information to the committee. Because I think it's important when you get to what number have you, have you sort of reached, you know, the tipping point, like you said. So I think we can get that information for you for sure. Thank you. Representative Hines. Wasn't there a Swedish study about um, autism rates that um, looked at people who were unvaccinated and people who were vaccinated, and there was the same number of autism in that population, a very large population? Um, one of the findings that supported autism not being produced by vaccines. 
Yeah. I'm not aware of that particular study, but I can definitely look for it. Yeah. Also, the, the difference between methyl thimerosal and ethyl thimerosal and, and packaged in multi-vol spike bio doses, are you aware of the difference between the two? Methyl thimerosal being mercury? Yeah. Right, no. We'll find it out for a minute. Yeah. But like I had mentioned, the, that our vaccines that we're using, um, you know, from the main immunization program do not contain the preservative thimerosal at this time. Thank you. Those are the single bio doses. None of the vaccines. The only vaccine relatively recently in the future was um, a multivial dose for influenza um, for the children over age three. Uh, but for the last number of years, I've just been getting the single dose vials. So even for my older kids that are getting influenza, they're not getting the so. All right, I just want to I just want to remind folks that we do have room in the welcome center for folks who are standing, uh, where the speakers are going going right there. And, and for fire code reasons, we really would appreciate it if um, if, if we, we didn't have people standing. Um, I'm going to give everyone notice. Um, uh, like 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 I was just doing, I'll list out the ten people in each group next, so you'll be able to hear when you're coming up. Um, just want to ask you to know. Any additional questions? Thank no you. additional questions. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll hear from Chick uh, Chick Chickati. <laughs> And I completely apologize. No, I know I'm mispronouncing your last name. Let's go, All right, you'll you'll get up there and you'll tell us. I am Senator Brady, Representative Kinney, members of the committee. My name is Chick Sisiati. Right. I live in Thompson. I'm a military retiree of 22 years in the United States Air Force. I'm the legislative chairman for the American Legion in the state of Maine. And I also represent the Mid-Coast Region Veterans, which consists of 